Shabbat Shalom. So we have a big group of our community is in Israel right now. We have 50 people with Roli and Felicia. And today, when you're in Israel, it's impossible to go anywhere in the country without seeing the words Yachad or Beyachad Nenatzeach, which means together we will win. They're plastered everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. On billboards, massive signs hanging from buildings, on t-shirts and necklaces that people are wearing, on the road signs, on bumper stickers, in parking lots, on the signs that are telling you where you should park and where you shouldn't park. They're emblazoned on the front of buses in place of the bus's destination. It says, Yachad Nenatzeach. It's even printed on the eggs that you can buy in the supermarket. There are stamps on each of the eggs, each one of the eggs. And it's stated at the end of every commercial or advertisement. Yachad Nenatzeach. Together, we will win. I first encountered the slogan a few months ago when a friend of mine who made Aliyah signed off on a text message in late October with Yachad Nenatzeach. I simultaneously felt a sense of hope and connection and pride while also feeling physically, I cringed. I felt an enormous sense of discomfort and a sense of dread. I found myself among the many wondering, what does it even mean? In particular, I was really focused on what it means to win. Is there even winning when it comes to war? Aren't we all, all of humanity, losing? 1,200 people plus massacred, raped, maimed, an entire nation is traumatized and grieving. We as Jews are traumatized and grieving. There's fear, there's anti-Semitism and hate that's prevailing. Over 200 plus innocent people were taken hostage and over 100, closer to 130, have yet to return and we pray they're still alive and they return soon. Soldiers are dying every day. Tens of thousands of innocent children, women, men, people in Gaza have been killed while hundreds of thousands are starving, houseless, and battling disease, one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. Can anyone really win? I was fixated on the latter part, the ninatseach part of this phrase, the we will win part of this slogan, until my trip to Israel a couple of weeks ago. As I met with Muslim Bedouin farmers, Jewish anti-government activists, Palestinian and Arab citizens of Israel who were partnering with Jewish citizens of Israel, Israeli refugees living in a hotel, youth who were fighting for LGBTQIA rights in Israel, Bedouin heroes who saved dozens on October 7th, survivors of the massacre, families who are praying for their family members to come home from captivity. My focus shifted to the first part the be'achad, the together part of this phrase. Who is included in this together? Yachad is an extreme simplification of a complex society and a fissured nation pushed even farther apart by Netanyahu and his government. My teacher, Rav Avital Hachstein, who lives in Israel, added depth to this very question in a podcast that Hadar has been putting out almost weekly, which is called On Sacred Ground. It's an opportunity for us to hear what's happening spiritually for those in Israel. She wondered out loud about who is included in this together. Who is this Yachad? How broad, she says, can this together be? Who is in and who is out? Do we perceive ourselves as a group that can hold diversity and in that together act upon what reality brings to us? Or does this unity mean an existence that is one dimensional? The painful reality that I re-encountered on the ground in Israel is that when we see the phrase Yachad Nenatzeach, together we will win, Yachad does not encompass what we want it to encompass, a unity which includes diversity. 
of ethnicities, of religion, opinion, and voice, the type of unity I would like to argue is modeled in this week's parasha, Parshat Pashalach, which is a unity that is at the core of our existence as a very nation, the very moment we came together. I want to share four short texts that bring to life the ways in which diversity played into leaving Egypt and our formation as a nation, our moment, again, of Yachad. Yachad Kulam, together we came together to sing. It is believed that as we left Egypt, we were not exclusively a group of Israelite slaves, but the Torah tells us, Vigam Erev Rav Allah Itam that even this Erev Rav also went up with them. This phrase Erev Rav only appears one time in the Torah. It's this one time, which means the scholars have no idea how to interpret it and they disagree through centuries on what it could actually mean. The common understanding is that Rav means many or a multitude and Erev means, comes from this root of Ein, Resh, and Vet, which means to mix. So when we put them together, it's often translated as a mixed multitude or a mix of peoples. It's powerful to know that in the formative moment of our peoplehood, there were other groups who became a part of our journey and who were critical to our formation as a nation. Some scholars understand that the Arab Rav as a group were actually non-Israelites, people of other religions or ethnic groups, even including, some say, Egyptians, who valued the idea of redemption for all people. Others see the Erev Rav as a mixed multitude representing the diversity that was within the Israelite nation, a diversity of opinions and people. In 2016, Jews for Racial Justice Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, known as JFREJ, which I know many have a relationship with here, published an online Haggadah using the Erev Rav as the title, calling it Mixed Multitudes, Nobody's Free Till Everybody's Free, a racial justice Haggadah for Pesach. Toward the opening of the Haggadah, they write, we are the mixed multitude, and we have always been a mixed multitude. They remind us that we as we formed as a nation, we were unified, but not void of any difference. Another beautiful example of unified diversity comes right before we cross the sea. The Israelites look ahead and they see that the sea is in front of them. They look behind and they see the Egyptians coming to kill them. They fear that their fate is clear. It's either death by drowning or death by sword. In this moment of desperation, the people begin to complain and they start to pray and they start to cry out and they say, why would you take us out of Egypt so that we could just be killed right here? Why would you do that to us? Why would this happen? We were okay there, we weren't going to die. We feel that this is the moment we're gonna die. And God responds by saying to Moshe, why are you crying out to me? Go forward. Go forward and go into the ocean. In a striking midrash, they pick up on this question that God asks Moshe. He says, Ma titzak elai? Why are you crying out to me? And the midrash answers this question, saying, God saying, why are you crying out to me? Why are you calling to me? The midrash says, we know God. You're the one that hears all the prayers. It actually quotes from Psalms. It says, hearer of prayer, to you all flesh will come. Why are we crying out to you? It's almost a funny question. Of course we would cry out to you, your God. You hear all the prayers. The Midrash then says, what does it actually mean to be the hearer of prayers? What does it mean for God to be the hearer of prayers? And it goes on to say that when people pray, when Israel was praying, you don't have them all pray as one, but rather each prays on their own. This one begins, and then the other one goes, after all they have finished their prayers, the angel appointed over prayers takes all the prayers that they prayed and crafts them into a crown and places it on God's head. 
What a stunning image. The diversity of prayer in this moment at the sea, and really I would say each moment that we pray, the multitude of yearnings and wants and needs and fears and hopes, despairs, they all come together creating one crown, but they're different. It reminds us that as we sit here praying, the same words come out of our mouths, but each means something different, each coming with a different piece of a unique piece of our souls, a unity that is created in the glory of difference. Even in our prayers at the sea, this is what happened. We were different and we were together. The third example I want to give is the sheer itself. It's the song that we sang on the other side of the sea, or maybe some argue that we sang while we were walking through the sea. One of my favorite teachings, which I know I've shared here before, is this rabbinic debate of how the people actually sang the song. What did it look like? What happened? Was it a refrain similar to the way that we pray Ki Olam Chasto, where Moses said, Ashiru Ladonai, and I will sing to God, and the people responded, Ashiru Ladonai, I will sing to God, and then Moshe said, Ki Ga'o Ga'a, for God has triumphed gloriously, and then the people responded, Ashiru Ladonai, I will sing to God, and so on. With each verse, Moses would sing a phrase, and they would respond, I will sing to God. Or maybe, the rabbis offer, it was a repetition of what Moses was saying. Moses would say, I will sing to God, and they responded, I will sing to God. And Moses would say, for God has triumphed gloriously, and they would respond, for God has triumphed gloriously. And so on, they repeated each phrase after Moshe as they sang the song. And finally, the last idea is potentially that it was done kulhu hade hadade, all together in unison, which is how I like to imagine this moment and the teaching that I want to focus on. Moshe opened his mouth, and as he started to sing, each and every person among them with their own experiences, their fears, their emotions, their grief, their relief, the pain and the sorrow, they opened their mouths, and they sang. While the words were identical, each person raised their own voice, adding their harmony in order to create the song as it needed to be in that moment. It was one song made up of many voices. The enormous power of communal singing is how we each come together to create something larger that transcends ourselves. Each person's voice adds to the harmony the words, the song, or the prayer as it is in that moment. At the foundation of our nationhood, at the moment of our freedom to be a nation, yachad kulam, together we came together, together all of us sang one song made up of hundreds of thousands of individual voices. There's a final teaching which I feel I need to look at and I want to look at as we go back to the moment of the crossing of the sea and the moment of our redemption and when we became a people. Roly mentioned this moment briefly last week before the prayer for Israel and the captives when he said, when we say these prayers, it's not political. When we say these prayers, it doesn't mean we cannot hold the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of those who are in Gaza who are suffering enormously. That one does not cancel out the other. And in our moment of peoplehood and coming together as a nation, we are reminded that our unity and our togetherness does not cancel out the unity and the togetherness, that yachad of other people. We're taught that in this moment, as the seas covered over the Egyptian people, as the Jewish people, the Israelites were fleeing and they made it to the other side, the Egyptians were coming after them and the seas covered them, killing all of them. The ministering angels turn to God and they want to praise God as they always do. And God rebukes them and says, my children lie drowning in the Red Sea 
and you want to sing? A dear friend and a former chavruta, a study partner of mine, once pointed out to me that the rabbi who this midrash is attributed to is Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan was said to have lost both of his parents when he was a baby, and in his lifetime, he buried 10 of his sons. He also lived in what must have been one of the most turbulent aftermath generations post-destruction of the temple. And yet, he still had empathy. His experience of grief led to an extreme empathy for the other, even the Egyptians who oppressed and enslaved us, which is extreme. It is profound that this teaching exists in the canon in the moment and at this very moment, and there is good reason that it is taught over and over again, because it's hard to do. Sometimes it feels impossible, or sometimes it's not right in that moment. And yet we can't forget it. We hold on to it, because our diverse unity is one more important, it's never any more important than the diverse unity of others. And so we come back to our slogan, Yachad Nenatzeach, together we will win. I'm still not really sure what winning means after so much loss, after so much pain and heartache and trauma and the grief that we feel. But I left Israel with an understanding of how our focus needs to be on the yachad, the together part of this slogan. How a shared society feels to me like our only way forward. How a narrow yachad, a narrow sense of unity, and a limited sense of humanity leads to at most a narrow victory and more realistically continues to lead us toward loss. But a victory that includes everyone, Be'yachad, together, has the potential to be redemptive. Shabbat Shalom.